40 days to learn film. Yeah, that's right. What you've read, you, you're going to need a scarf for a little bit uh, when we come to a certain section of this. This is me. My name's Mark Cousins. That's me on a beach. I love beaches. I think it's an evening beach in a Scottish island. I'm probably best known for this, the story of film, a book and a film I made a few years ago that tried to be a passionate history of cinema told from a global perspective, not only Hollywood. That's me as a wee boy. <laughs> I guess I was about, what, four there or something in Northern Ireland. And I was already at that stage falling in love with movies. I wasn't good at reading or things, but boy, was I in love with movies that I felt as if they took me by the hand and sort of showed me the world. And then when I grew up, I was lucky enough to work close to cinema and then make films. That's me with David Lynch, the great filmmaker, interviewing him. And we wanted to do it somewhere unusual. So see in the background there, there are sharks. We filmed in an aquarium and he talks about having ideas as like uh, fishing, diving deep, so I thought it would be fun to have sharks in the background. That's me in Kurdistan in Iraq. I made a film about children in Iraq and how they tell stories and their worldview. I've always uh, thought that Pablo Picasso was right when he said all children are artists. And then... <laughs> I love to dance. And that's uh, me and Tilda Swinton, the great performer, filmmaker, actor, Tilda Swinton. And we decided for fun, just purely for fun, to recreate a dance routine um, by Laurel and Hardy, uh, the old uh, movie, black and white movie comedians. This is the view of my window right now. I took this picture a few minutes ago and it's springtime and the daffodils are out on the left, as you can see, and various other flowers that I don't know the name of. And see on the far right there, slightly out of focus, there's a tree. That's the first thing I see every morning. And that tree uh, makes me feel alive, just the fact that it's there. But of course, I'm inside at the moment because like many of us, I'm staying in because of the virus, and maybe you're in the same thing. This is me in my flat, but I guess one of the points I want to make today is when we have cinema, when we have the films of Isabelle Huppert, for example, we're not wholly alone. I feel that cinema took me on a magic carpet ride long before I'd been to America or India or Iran or any of those places. I saw them through the eyes of the movie makers. And at this time, when we can't travel a lot, when we feel contained, when we feel cocooned in some way, then cinema, we're reminded, is a kind of magic carpet ride. So how do we use this time indoors? What if we imagine a film school? <laughs> One that lasts 40 days, because maybe we'll be indoors for 40 days and 40 nights. What would that film school be like? What could it be like? Look at him. He published this book, Thomas More. Utopia, in which he imagined what a perfect world could be. There's a section on education. It imagines the best way to learn. So what is the best way to learn? Imagine. Imagine that we open the door after these 40 days. You'll recognize this, of course. The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy opening the door. We see the world anew after 40 days. And what follows, I'm going to be talking about what we might do in that film school, what, how we might think of movies. I'm going to be talked about, talking about aspects of the style of movies, their ideas, their emotions, practical things, fun things. Unfortunately, if you're studying film or if you've got a good 
film teacher, which I'm sure you have, this probably won't fit into your course. I'm really sorry. I know you study things like eyeline matching and all like that. I don't know if there'll be as much on that as you'd like. Is it going to be more about the passion for cinema? But we will see global film. You're going to see clips and things about film from around the world. And you're going to see lots of movies directed by women. So how do we start? Let's start with colour. And this particular clip. This is an amazing Indian film. As you can see, it's called Sideshri Devi. It's directed by Mani Kal, who was a wonderful man. Just watch and see. This is a sort of documentary. You'll hear my voice in this a little bit because this is a clip from the story of film and you'll also hear me saying something else which is probably a bit rubbish but just look at the imagery the woman looking into camera then the camera moves back again and she moves back not much colour so far And look at this colour, the red of the thing on the left and the red of those two people walking up the steps. And what's the boy doing? Standing there with his arms like that. And then, and then look, the camera starts to move up and he starts to do his prayer-like movement, his devotional movement. And then look at this colour, the blue of the boat, the brown of their skin. Does this look like a documentary? It looks more like an opera in some ways. And look at that shot. Two hands and this out of focus colour in the foreground. Camera tilts up. Look at that composition. Look at that tenderness. A dream world. That languor. Feel we're in a dream world here somehow. And I say again, this is a documentary. Look at that composition, them lying to one side, her head back, and then she turns it. You could draw the frames of these and then look at that, that turquoise. Suno Arjun, Ek Sidhi or Sadi Kahani hai. Ek Purana Kail Yakata. There's the red again on the right. Manikal was a master of this framing, this emotion, her left eye, her face covered by his arm, the gentleness of that movement, and then this crane shot, where do you see this crane shot? Up and up and past a temple and past those birds. And then we slowly turn around. On what are we traveling? How do you describe this? Is this elegy? What words would you use? And then the window opens. And there's that boat. Another crane shot. And then we float down to a mother and child. The mother and child. What is it about crane shots? They seem to take us into a different realm. 
You get the pink of this boat piercing sideways. We could have started on a wide shot of that pink boat, but because he's close in, then the pink comes in from the right side. And then those people standing. Like a sculpture. Like a funeral. How beautiful was that? Also on color. A simple thing. We think of colors as, gr as shadows as gray, don't we? Shadows are gray if you draw them, they're gray, and yet they're not when you look. Shadows are usually blue. I took this in the snow last winter. And somebody who knew that the shadows are blue was Vincent van Gogh. Look at the shadows to the left and the right of this tree. Blue shadows, not grey shadows. And look at the shadows here. This is Alfred Hitchcock's film Vertigo. Look on the left, the colour of the shadows. Pink. Look at the right, look at the colour of the shadows on the bed. And the colour in the dark bits, pink and turquoise. Shadows of Colour. This is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Pier Johan Casalo's Three Rooms of Melancholia. She was a Finnish filmmaker, is a Finnish filmmaker. And this is a Chechen boy who's been blooded, i.e. the blood of a sacrificial animal has been put on the child's head. And when I think about it, this particular piece of curled wire reminds me to say this. Everything that you're seeing now is not, I haven't cleared copyright of anything, the clips, the images, etc. So, you know, this is at a time of crisis like the moment when we're all in this together. I'm just hoping that the people who own these images won't get annoyed for copyright reasons. Anyway, that's colour done. What could be the next thing that we look at on the next day in our 40-day film school? What about... Eyeline. What does that mean? Take this for example. This is a great film called Dreamcatcher by Kim Longinotto, a British filmmaker. On the right there, there's a woman called Brenda. She was a former sex worker and now turned social worker. And she's talking on the left there to a woman who's still currently a sex worker. And Brenda tries to help these women. What's interesting for us here is the eyeline cameras outside their look they're looking at each other with such intensity with such closeness right to left left to right our eyes scan with their eyes the the empathy in this look this is human connection as you can see we are on this side of them if we jumped around and put the camera on the other side of them brenda would be looking in a different direction here she's looking from right to left if we jumped around she'd be looking left to right if you're studying film i'm sure you've studied eyelines but what about other types of eyelines what about this errol morris's film the fog of war Where's this guy looking? Is he looking to somebody else in the frame? No. Is he looking to somebody else to the left or right of the camera? No. He's looking straight at the camera. He's being interviewed and Errol Morris came up with something what he called the interatron, I think, where the person looks into the camera and can see the filmmaker. Why would you do this? For intensity. So that you feel as if this man... McNamara is looking right at us, right at us. But what about if we jump from this, is the next one, is that, is she looking right at us? This is from the great film Tokyo Story by Yasujiro Ozu. And uh, this woman appears to be looking right at us, which is quite unusual in a fiction film, because usually the spell is broken, as we say, the fourth wall is <clears throat> broken as we say but she's almost looking at us and he this filmmaker likes to do this can you hear a siren outside my door there's a hospital near me and so we get lots of lots of ambulances going past and so you'll hear a few of those as i speak i'm sure the doppler effect 
Anyway, back to this woman. She's almost looking at us. Or do you feel, look closely, do you feel that she's actually looking over your right shoulder like this? This is a Russian icon painting of Jesus Christ. And it feels to me as if he's not looking exactly like us, but just over my right shoulder a little bit. The idea here is that heaven, paradise, is just over our right shoulder, close by, almost there, almost attainable. This image is trying to get us to feel close to paradise, that it's possible to attain. Back to Ozu's woman. Something similar there. He was very interested in balance within frames. Look how balanced this frame is. There's the Christ again. But of course, more complex looking we can get in imagery as well. Like this, for example. This is a photograph by Ronnie Sen. Uh, this is in uh, an Indian train carriage. Where does your eye fall first? My eye falls first on the guy on the right who's asleep looking out of the image on the right. But then my eye goes to the smaller guy who's sitting up towards the top of the frame on the left. He's looking down to all those people who are sitting on carriages, some people lying asleep, it looks like just on the floor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can count eight people in that image. None of them really looking at each other. A kind of frenzy of eye lines. Fantastic image. Every, everybody looking outwards, no connection there. Move from this to something. This could be a big jump, right? We're talking about looking here. Do you know what I would like to talk about next? Day three, wedding films. Now, why would we want to talk about wedding films? I'm really interested in popular cinema. What is really popular? What makes popular cinema? What entertains? What's the mechanism of entertaining? Why are some films so incredibly successful? If I ask you what the most biggest box office successes of all time were, you might say Star Wars or you might say Avengers Assemble or something like that. But in fact, if you take the amount that a film took and divide it by its budget, you find that the most popular films of all time are wedding films like this one, The Wedding Banquet, Taiwan, beautiful film. This one, Four Weddings and the Funeral, a British film, huge hit. This one, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, huge hit. This one, Monsoon Wedding, an Indian film, huge hit. Muriel's Wedding, Mamma Mia. Bridesmaids. I mean, I can only speculate because I've never made any of these films. Maybe you would like to think why that is. For me, it's something to do. There's an inbuilt storyline. We, the audience, when we're watching these films, know that eventually, after all the getting dressed and the hen night and the stag night and whatever it is, there's going to be a climax. Everybody's going to get together. There's going to be a party. There's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be some dancing, some alcohol probably, and conflict and emotions. Everybody around the world understands what a wedding is. It's a kind of template. It's a kind of um, fable almost. And of course, wedding films often are very cheap to make because they're mostly set present day, etc. So those of you who are filmmakers, you know, we can't be snooty about these very, very popular films and we can ask, what can we learn from them? Jumping from wedding films to something completely different, what if in day Four, we look at drawing in films. Now, that sounds weird, isn't it? But I think we as filmmakers or film lovers, we sort of need to be interested in line, how a line works, etc. A drawn line. You know, if you draw yourself, is that what you could look like? One of the great filmmakers, Orson Welles, drew. This is a drawing he did of a sketch for an office design in a film that he made about Kafka's film, The Trial, which central character is K. That's why it says K's office. And here is the image that came from it. So we saw the sketch and there's the real thing. Notice the same perspective of the lights plunging into the distance and there's K on the right there. One of the best uh, drawers or painters in cinema was 
Akira Kurosawa. This is his painting of Lady Macbeth. And when he filmed her uh, in his film Throne of Blood, look, isn't that fantastic? Back to the painting, back to her. That sense of the image, of the line, of the drawn film is so powerful. I think that nearly any film we watch, we can think of it as a drawn thing. And talking about drawing, wait till you see this. Pablo Picasso. What's he drawing? A circle. Are they stones? We watch. Still don't know. Little squiggle in the middle there, these things. And then. Okay, we got it, haven't we? What is it? It's. A bunch of flowers, isn't it? Or is it? What's this? Oh, what's that? Oh, we've jumped to the other side of the screen. There's the ambulance again. It's not a bunch of flowers, it's a fish. There's its eye. What's lovely is what he transformed something. He transformed the flowers into a fish. And I think that when we make films or when we watch films, we're always looking for a kind of transformation. I know when I'm making films, I want it to start like a bunch of flowers, my film. And then somehow I want to turn it into a fish if I can. I'd say more importantly in life, you know, we want to turn turn ourselves into something else. When you're young, maybe you're a bunch of flowers. When you get older, you're a fish. But hold on, what's he doing up here? What's that swirly thing up there and that circle? Oh, oh, it's a cockerel. So the flowers become a fish, become a cockerel. A bird. That, I think, is a sort of lesson in itself. That, I think, is creativity in itself. When we make something, it should transform. When we watch something, it should transform. Day five. Focus. Leonardo da Vinci. And looking to the side of this woman's head. Look how out of focus that landscape is. Look how out of focus her face is. The great Italian painter called this sfumato, which I think means smoky. It's as if we're looking at this through smoke. But what does it do to the emotion or the poetics of the image? For me, it makes it feel otherworldly. It makes it feel romantic. It makes it feel as if, you know, when you're really, really close to something, it goes out of focus. I feel extremely close. I feel as if I can, you know, feel her breath on my hands or on my face. That intimacy that he gets with that. And what about filmmakers? There's a film called Mother and Son, as you can see by Alexander Sokurov. And look at that image. It's all out of focus. This is the son on the right, obviously. The mother's dying on the left, and he's tending her. And just like the previous Leonardo image, Sokurov is interested in intimacy here. The intimacy of the mother and son's relationship. And the out of focus helps with that. But also, I think, notice something else in the image. The colour, the lack of colour. It's like a green, there's like a death-like feeling about it. A sort of end of days. And then look at the distortion on the image in maths it's called shearing it's as if this is a piece of rubber which has been stretched from the bottom right to the top left so it becomes diagonal i don't know how to describe the emotional effect of that or the poetic effect of that but it feels as if their world is stretched there's a tension in their world and what about this little gif so a woman's face in the foreground starts slightly in focus, but a massive focus pull, 
massive focus pulled to the two women in the background there. What we learn when we watch this whole film is that that woman in the foreground is also one of the women in the background, which of course is physically impossible. But the filmmaker is one of the great filmmakers, and this is her, Gira Muratova. And she really, really um, taught us so much about filmmaking. Have a look at her work when you can. Some of it's online. Day six. This is the last thing I'd like to talk about before we take a break. Day six, depth or the z-axis. That's another mathematical term. You know, x and y are up and down when and on image, but z is imagining that you go into the image from you out into the world. From me out into the world feels a strange thing to say to today when so many of us can't really go out into the world. But the z-axis is the empathy axis. We go back to Kira Muratova thing again. Look at that. This is a Z-axis image. We're going from close by to far away. This painting by Mantegna is a Z-axis image. He could have painted the dead Christ, you know, from, uh, from above or from the side. But he, it's as if he's sitting at the Christ's feet, looking down the length of his body. And so we feel like we're one of the mourners. We feel as if we're part of the family. There's two mourners on the left there crying, but we feel because of this Z axis, because of this depth, that we are sitting at the feet of the Christ. One thing I should say, it's terrible because this is considered a masterpiece, but the feet are far too small. They should be twice that size uh, for this perspective to work. Then... We're getting near the end of this first session. Look at this. This is a film called The Night It Rained, as you can see by Kamran Shirdel, a great Iranian filmmaker. I've used this image because of the Z-axis, the depth of field, that shot, that image is plunging into the distance, the railway line. And filmmakers, as we know, uh, love using such images. It gives the illusion of space. But I also want to tell you the story of this image. You see that boy and what he's got in his hand? It's a story. It, this is a documentary. It's a true story. Uh, it rained one night. A train was coming along the track. The rain was so heavy that the track was damaged and fell away. The train would have gone over the damaged bit, would have fallen into a ravine, and the people on the train would have been killed. Except this little boy here realized that so he took his jacket, he set it on fire, he stood on the track and waved it to stop the train. The train stopped and the people were saved. He was a hero, he was acclaimed in the media, etc. And so uh, a filmmaker, Cameron Sheardell, decided to make a film about this little boy, this hero. He went to the place where it all happened and interviewed people and said, tell me what happened. And you know what people said? It didn't happen. <laughs> it was all a lie. It was all made up. It was an urban myth. And then Cameron Sheardell cuts to people who said, of course it happened. This boy's a hero. We, our community owns him so much. So this is one of the first great documentaries about the nature of truth. Can we believe what we hear? Are there multiple points of view and things? Wonderful film. And also talking about the Z-axis, Charlie Chaplin. So often in his films, he walks into the distance. That lovely sense at the end of a film where we're behind the character, we can see the world ahead of them. We can see, is this a new dawn? And he does that lovely skippy walk. This is probably inspired by a very famous painting, this one by Caspar David Friedrich. A man stands on a rocky outcrop, looking into the world, looking into the distance, looking into the misty hills. Something that we can't fully do at the moment unless we are living in the countryside. But that is the desire to get out in the world, the desire we all feel at the moment. And just for a laugh, some years ago when I was in Slovenia, I recreated that painting. <laughs> That's me standing with a stick. And so... That's the end of point part one of my little chat. And I suggest that in our 40 days, we could have a day off.
Okay, so uh, my name's Mark Cousins and I'm a filmmaker and what I'm doing in this little talk is trying to look at the movies in 40 different ways, 40 unusual ways, 40 ways that sort of excite or stimulate me as a filmmaker and as a film lover. Uh, what I've described it as sort of is uh, 40 days to learn film. So, day eight obsessive motifs. I think that when to be a filmmaker, you know, to be a film lover as well, sometimes we need a bit of obsession, a bit of dogged determination. And uh, a few filmmakers are particularly good at this. This one, Martin Scorsese, there he is in his native Little Italy. And you would th and you think so many of his films are set in this part of the world. Uh, the famous gangster film that he made and uh, Taxi Driver, etc. Those streets, everything about those streets, from the fire hydrant there to the sign of the walk and don't walk, etc. These things are sort of, they're almost like notes in his symphony. And he repeated them so often. What about this? Uh, another filmmaker with her obsessions is Agnes Varda. Um, she made the f a film called The Gleaners and I. It was about people who pick up, you know, stuff that's been discarded by society, by markets. And in particular, she looked at the f the potatoes that are discarded because they're misshapen. And she found potatoes like this one, which is heart-shaped. And she kept pot such potatoes and let them wither and let them sprout, etc. And she became... Uh, somebody for whom potato was an image of love, of earthiness, of working classness, etc. And <laughs> there she is, dressed as a potato, as you do. And there she is with loads of potatoes behind her. What I like about this image, it's, it's as if we're seeing inside her head. It's as if her head has exploded with potatoes. Uh, but uh, I'm talking not only about cinema here, I'm talking about imagery more general. And so I always think of this filmmaker, Lionel Fendinger, um, who was part of the Bauhaus. Uh, and he found a church called the Gelmeroda Church. And here it is. Here's what it actually looks like. And look what he made of it. Spindly and dual coloured and then spacey and pastel and then spiky and edgy, and then something, you know, slightly more abstract. And then I went to the church and I did my scribble, and there's my scribbled version. What I love the fact is that, you know, he didn't have to keep going to big cathedrals or fancy places to get inspiration. There's one little church in this one village was enough for him to nourish his outer eye, his inner eye, his sense of form and story and um, aliveness. And I think we can learn that, that as film lovers or just human beings, that there might be something right in front of our eyes that we look at every day. And every day that looking is a kind of restorative thing. Another famously obsessive painter, Vincent van Gogh, and he was in a sanatorium in Saint-Rémy in France, and this was the view from his window on a rainy day, a field, that kind of L-shaped wall, and that bush behind it, and same field, same wall, same bush. You can see the wind in the grass there, can't you? And the wind in the sky. Look at that, same field, same wall, same bush, but baking hot, surely. The grass isn't curling anymore. It looks as if it's been raked, combed. And look at that. That could be an image from, I don't know, the 1400s or something. It looks so old, so sepia, ink, of course. And this, uh, just like the Gelmaroda church, was an obsession just like the potatoes, just like Little Italy. So this repeated encounter with the the thing that's out your window, as it were, the thing that you're obsessed by, becomes kind of devotional. And since we're looking at fields, I thought that 
day nine, we could look at nature in cinema. What I always say that, you know, even if you go to a film and it's terrible, you're likely to see a tree or a sunset or something that raises your spirit. And I think that nature, we don't really talk about nature in cinema all that much because it's so obvious. You just point your camera at a lovely landscape and it seems effortless to to create an image of it. But look at this, for example. This is a famous silent film by Victor Sjöström, Swedish director, called The Wind. And The Wind, this is a woman who's haunted... She's had a terrible husband, she buries him, she kills him, buries him, and then the wind blows the f the sand away and the body, the body begins to appear. And the wind becomes a kind of metaphor or the kind of sound of her own f storm, the own tempest in her head. Talking of wind, Terence Malick, Tree of Life. Terence Malick films full of wind. He's famous for images of... Uh, wind blowing across grass, for example. That sense of, for, for Malik, wind is a kind of sign of life. And because he's quite a religious figure, sometimes a sign of a kind of spirit, of the Holy Spirit arriving or something like that. Talking of trees of life, this is a, a artwork by Ulbricht Dürer, one of my heroes, a uh, uh, a, f a painter from the 1400s and 1500s and look at the quality of that image that tree and what I love about it is it's so central so stately so straight um, it's the nobility of that tree the tree of life you remember when I started this I showed you a picture outside my window of the tree I see every morning well I think this tree reminds me of it and then from this to one of the best films about nature I think I've ever seen Michelangelo Framartino's film Le Quattro Volte. It's sort of a documentary, but sort of not. It begins <laughs> It begins when we see an old gentleman who's a goat herder. He's in the church in this village in Calabria, and he's gathering the dust of the floor of the church. Why? To make medicine. He turns into a potion and drinks it. He drinks the dust of the church, and you think, why would he do that? And then the film moves on, and we see goats giving birth, and you think, okay, what, what's that got to do with what we've just seen? Then we see trees, trees like this one, being chopped down, and they're used as in the village for decoration, for example. This looks like a Christmas tree. But then the trees are turned into charcoal. They're burnt, turned into charcoal. And, of course, the smoke goes up in the air somewhat and then descends and becomes the dust in the floor of the church, the very dust that the man eats. And so we've got the circle of life. You know, we saw the birth of the goats and we see this old man, you know, using, as it were, eating the trees almost, the circle of life. Uh, it's based on Pythagoras' ideas, but it's a magical film about the fact that life goes on. Also about nature, look at this lovely image from Lottie Reiniger's film Thumbelina. Reiniger was um, an animator and she used this cut technique that you can see here, silhouettes. And it's about to tell the story of Thumbelina, the little girl who goes on a journey. But the journey is a nature journey. And she looks like insects at some point and she looks like trees at other point. And that sense of the little girl being absolutely part of the flux of nature is beautifully done and from this this image when i was thinking about what to say reminded me of bing, this image falling leaves by alice guy blaché alice guy blaché was the first one of the first great filmmakers the first great woman filmmaker she made like a hundred feature films she's the first person to run a film studio etc a kind of pioneer you could say in a way that cinema was partly started by her. And what I like about this image is this is a, a little girl here who's tying leaves back onto the tree because she's been told that her sister, I think, will die when autumn comes, when the leaves fall. And so to stop the leaves falling, she's tying them back onto the tree. Beautiful image. So many ways of looking at nature in cinema. 
And from nature, I'd like to go to something really quite different to the, one of the most intellectual bits of, of the way cinema works, which is this thought. Can a film think? Can we see the thoughts of the filmmakers when we watch their movies? Well, let's have a look at this. It's, the film's called The House is Black. It was made in Iran by Forug Forogzad, a legendary figure, a, a feminist, a poet. Her work is still well known in Iran. She made this film in the 60s. She um, tragically died in a road traffic accident. This is a film that's become well known now that um, was filmed with people with leprosy in a place where they were living. Now you could make a general film like that, interview people, do wide shot, medium close, make it about the social issues, uh, in, interview doctors, you could interview specialists, policies, health policy people, etc. But she didn't do that. She did this. We track into a man, he's is he covering his ears. A strange shot. And then man praying his hands up. Start to look at the hands in this clip. And this, what's she thinking here? She's thinking he's going to move forward, so I track forward. No hand held. We can see she's thinking in terms of form. Static shot, static shot. Tracking right. Pass these people the chess pieces and back to the man's hands and then her hands, then his hands and then that single hand and then these troubling images faces, look how fast we're cutting what, are, what is this, is this like a mosaic? like cubism another hand with prayer beads and then those two plastic or wooden hands and this pan down. Just think in terms, in purely visual terms, graphic matches. What does this image remind me of? What does it connect to? What is it visually similar to? And there's that image we saw before, which looks like a blind or a window. So what, what she was doing there was not only thinking of this as a social issue or a medical problem. She was thinking of this as, a, as a, an aesthetic problem. She was looking for visual rhymes, shots that rhymed with each other. In other words, she was making poetry. Now, this next clip uh, is f uh, called material object at noon as you can see there it's directed by Apichapong Verisathakul now he is a Thai director and he is one of the most inventive filmmakers in cinema maybe maybe many of you will know his work this is one of his first films I think his first feature length film and he used for it an idea that the surrealists had called the exquisite corpse. Again, you probably know what that means. But for those of you who don't, it was a way of doing a drawing in a very unusual manner. A person did a bit of a drawing, then another person did the next bit, the next person did the next bit, a fourth person did the next bit, etc. But each subsequent person couldn't see what the previous person did. You fold it over the page so you only can see your bit. You can't tell the full picture. And this is what Api Chapong used, the technique he used for this. This is subtitled in French and so I'm going to have to translate it for you. Do you have another story to tell, real? or imagined. Once upon a time there was a disabled boy and his teacher. While they were studying, the teacher went to the toilet. He saw an object falling from her dress. A mysterious object. From village to village, the filmmaker asked people to invent a story using the exquisite, exquisite corpse technique. The object is round, it fell from the sky and turned into a human being. And why was the boy unwell? 
I think he was born like that. Not everyone was born lucky. He told me that he told them they'd like to go to Bangkok. Dog Farah and he were ready to go. What's interesting is that those voices, those people telling the story, uh, they hadn't heard the previous bit of the story. They were just telling their bit. It's a complicated technique, but imagine we're so used to stories being controlling things where everything is organized well in advance. What if it's not organized well in advance? What if pure chance comes into the process? And talking of which, I want to do something really quite unusual now for a f talk about film, which is to look at... Day 11, storytelling before the Renaissance. So we're going way back to the 1300s here. And this painting by Vitali di Bologna is called The Adoration of the Magi. The top left in the black dress is the Virgin Mary on her knee is the Christ. Then you see those one guy kneeling with an orange thing. That's one of the kings. Two other kings beside him. And down on the bottom right, uh, people, the, the horses on which they traveled and two saints on the left. But if we look at the bottom right bit first and defocus the rest of it, it's like nighttime down there, isn't it? That silver path skirting upwards and those two people are presumably attendants waiting on the kings to returning and the two horses, the horses, <laughs> because if one of them's got a traffic cone on its head. But immediately we're struck by in a single image, we've got things that could not exist. The king is not sitting on top of the heads of the horses or of the attendants. Um, the attendants are much smaller than the king, for example. So what we can see here is several spaces combined, but also you could say several times combined. Things that happened in the past, the present, are all in the same image. Go to the next thing here, this close-up. There are the two attendants, there are the two horses, and look at the eyes. <laughs> there, look at the two, four, five, six eyes in this image. Look at the way they're staring at each other. This is a little microcosm. This is a little story in itself. You can hear the horses almost. There's another ambulance going by me. You can hear the horses. You can see this nighttime scene. silvery path etc now if we go up to the top look at this these are two of the kings and one of them looks as if he's got an arm in a sling and the one in he the one in green is pointing up to the star that brought them there those two are staring at themselves they're in their own little world too this is like a second story almost separate from the rest then go to this image which is the virgin mary and the christ in the middle touching her and t touching the king's head look at that flow of eye movements from christ to the virgin mary the the king looks as if he's looking at christ's knee or he's bowing his eyes this is a little story in itself this is like the third story in this picture the third moment the third space in this picture and then look at these two. This is the, the one on the right is St. Catherine. We can tell that because she's got a Catherine wheel. But these two saints are in their own world. So this is like the fourth story in this image. And then jump to the top and above the arch. You see that thing in the middle there? That's the hand of the king that we saw earlier. But on either side, we've got angels. So they're outside the story again. So is this like the fifth story? And yet, back to the full painting, it all combines into one image. And what was great about storytelling back then in the Renaissance is that, in the pre-Renaissance, is that they didn't try to, they didn't try to tell it all within one space. All this could happen, all these simultaneous events, all these micro stories could all be combined into one design. And I think as filmmakers or film lovers, we could ask ourselves, is a Hitchcock film like this? Is an Agnes Varda film like this? Or is it more like this? A cubist painting by George Brock, where we look at here a violin and a jug and probably other things that we can't quite work out. Look at them from multiple points of view at the same time.
it's sort of challenging, but I think that it's very interesting to think of a movie in those terms. That was day 11. What should we do in 12, day 12? Why don't we go, bing, walk about? Um, we, you know, we can't do loads of walking at the moment because of the crisis outdoors, but um, this idea of the walkabout in many cultures, particularly in Australian culture, is a mythic thing. Walkabout, this is an Aboriginal artwork, walkabout is something that you do maybe in your teenage years, maybe during puberty, maybe when you're growing into a woman or into a man, and the idea is you go and isolate yourself, be on your own, Find your mythic self, almost. Connect with the universe. Uh, a great British film directed by Nicholas Rogue was about that. There it is, uh, set in Australia. The woman, the girl in white is a British school girl, very posh, very br brought up in a sort of very uh, Anglo environment. But she and her younger brother behind her there get lost in the outback and they meet this guy played by David Gulpilil and what happens they go on a walkabout and she discovers her body her sexuality the the little boy discovers his ability to just cope with things he doesn't he's not rational like her he's using his more primitive mind and they encounter the universe they encounter something bigger than themselves something scary troubling but there's an opening up a plenitude in the film, and that is essential to the idea of a walkabout. Next image is from another film about a walkabout. Agnes Varda's Cleo from five to seven. Look at her. She's having fun. And yet the film doesn't start with her having fun. The film starts with her getting a cancer diagnosis uh, and which is, of course, a tragic thing. But what does she do? She decides to go and walk, almost walk it out of her system, walk the streets of Paris. Uh, and she walks in real time between five o'clock and seven o'clock. Having the diagnosis makes her look at the world anew. There's a world shift for her. Uh, she discovers things. She looks into people's faces. She meets a guy. She goes to this park, I think it's called the Parc Montsouris. And she just discovers what it's like to be alive just like the people in the walkabout discover what it's like to be alive that alertness that open open onto the fields and to the sky and from that film to this film which is kelly reichardt's western meeks cut off look at the beauty of that image before even we know look at the use of color that gold and that lime green and that light pink of the dresses and yet their headscarves are different colours turquoise, a kind of mauve purple and like a cream the sky it's, it's a beautiful image it's set in 1845 it's based on a true story these are frontiers people they're looking to, we have to say now colonise bits of the Midwest, the outback, they're, but they're searching for something else. These women are being led by men, and particularly one man, Meek, who's pretending that he knows the way, but he sort of doesn't. And through the course of the film, they realise that, and they realise that they are sort of in control of their own lives, or they have to try and take control. So it's the film's about destiny and power and ownership. So those are examples of walkabout of where movies are great at doing journeys mythic journeys journeys of discovery day 13 story economy i've just got one example of this i'm not talking a lot about story here because you all know so much about story and i don't so <laughs> you probably know more than me but i want to talk about one film that i think is great at the economy of the story and it's this film, Wednesday, by Viktor Kosakovsky. Viktor Kosakovsky was born on the 19th of July, 1961, in St. Petersburg, in Russia. And what did he try to do? He decided to try and make a film about everybody who was born on that day, everybody in that city. And he found that 101 people were born on that day. 
usually when we make a film, we how many characters can you have in a 90 or 100 minute film? What, five, six, seven, eight, nine? He tried to make a film with 100 people in it. It sounds chaotic. It sounds as if it couldn't work. And yet, after I saw that film, I was shaking and in tears because he managed to do little portraits, little sketches, little haikus of so many of the people, including the two people in this image. He captured a moment. He captured a moment in a city's life. And some of the people had died, of course, and they'd lived a hard life under the Soviet Union. And he managed in his massive panorama to show us that. It's great. Great film. Day 14, kick out the truth. Now, this is where we get very serious because we've got two examples here of films that are deeply morally serious and in some ways problematic, but they what they're trying to both address is this question is what if things have happened in the world that people are trying to hide, that have been buried? that are people refuse to admit to because the things were so terrible. And we have two examples of that. The first is from a film called The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On. It's about a guy called Mr. Okuzakai, who's a soldier. He fought in World War II. And after the war finished, when he was in Papua New Guinea, several of his friends, his fellow soldiers, disappeared and died. And Mr. Okuzaki, unbelievably, and this is very troubling, discovered that they had been killed and eaten, eaten by the commanders of their, of their regiments. Cannibalism. Of course, Japanese society did not want to admit that at all. But what does he do? He thinks it's so important to get this acknowledged that he goes and visits the commanders, uh, the people who, who either did the killing and the cannibalism themselves or know about it and who are refusing to talk. And this scene is one where the first person you're going to see is one of the commanders and then you'll see Mr. Okuzakai's mixture of politeness and rage. <laughs> I can't really tell you. I'm too busy, I must go. And they will just slow mo. Mr. Okuzaka, that's him in the suit. Attacking, jumping on. And this is Japan. And people are usually so polite and respectful. <laughs> It's scarcely believable. An interviewer beating up the interviewee. Why hit me? The final question. The reason why he hits him is because he feels you have to kick the truth out of him. What an incredibly hard film to watch and how ethically disturbing. And talking of which, here's a still from the film Shoah, a very long film, I'm sure you've seen it, about the Holocaust. On the left is Claude Landsman, 
the filmmaker who obsessively searched for the perpetrators of the crime, the attempted assassination of the Jewish people, in which six million people were killed. And on the right is one of the commanders at Treblinka death camp. And this commander does not know he's being filmed. As you can see, it's a grainy image. There's a hidden camera. And Landsman on the left felt that the only way to get this man to tell what actually happened in Treblinka, that there were gas chambers there, is to flatter his ego, hide a camera, and then try to get him to not confess, but to boast about it. Now, ethically, you could say it's really wrong not to, to lie to somebody to get the truth, but in both these examples, surely, surely it's justified. Anyway, from ridiculous and from the awful to the sublime. Day 15, now we're talking. What is the sublime? The sublime was brought up, it was an idea by this guy, Edmund Burke, uh, Irish writer, brilliant writer, very conservative. But he came up with this idea, or he at least ex extended the idea that sometimes we look at something which is, which is beautiful and scary at the same time, like the Alps, for example. They are beautiful and scary. A, a, a volcano is beautiful and scary, that we're overwhelmed by a sense of awe at something. And we all feel this at time, whether it's a fantastic fireworks display or a movie that just we feel our head flooding with sensations which are all mixed up so here's an example of it the white diamond directed by Werner Herzog great German documentary filmmaker who have who really believed in the sublime so in this film what we're looking at here is a waterfall in South America and um, Herzog had heard from local people a legend that behind the waterfall there's a cave and inside the cave is filled with something. What is it? Gold? Is it treasure? Etc. Uh, there's something down there. And so Herzog drops a, a, a rope and has his camera person go down on the rope and films the cave. The, we see swallows flying into the cave. And... After this shot, we think we can't wait to see what's in the cave. But Werner Herzog says on the soundtrack, we filmed it, but it was too beautiful, so you can't see it. And that's something like the sublime. It's so beautiful that you'd be overwhelmed. By, on, by not showing it, he uses, makes us use our imagination. A very different type of movie sublime, you could say, is this. This is the film The Exorcist, uh, which I saw too young and really gave me nightmares. Um, it's, of course, about a, a girl possessed by the devil, and this is the priest coming to try and exorcise the devil from the girl's mind and body and spirit. What's sublime here is the lighting, first of all, that the light flooding out of the room as if there's something in there, something overwhelmingly powerful, something timeless, evil or good, or the, we're about to see the combination, the, uh, the uh, miscegenation of evil and good. And that, you know, I'm not Christian and lots of us are religious and lots aren't, but if, even if you're not religious to see this clash between elemental forces of good and evil with something like the sublime something like a volcano and from the same era the death star and star wars uh, i remember as a boy seeing this and this is another example of the movie sublime it was so massive when it appeared on the screens and the big screens and when we first saw star wars we were overwhelmed all those tiny dots of lights are rooms and this is like a spherical city it's sort of perfect but evil as well it is the devil in some ways look at that beautiful light curving on it it's like a moon and it's like the devil and talk about talking about the moon look at this Greta Garbo silent cinema she wipes her brow, the sadness of her face, isolated in a dark sky, the moonlight on her hair, light bouncing off her face. She's like a distant star. Is it tragedy? Is she smelling that? Is she, she just had bad news? And she, 
the sort of definition of the movie Sublime. Look at that image of her. So we just see the trace of her nose and her chin and her neck and her shoulder and her hair. And look at that picture of her. Backlit, eroticized. We can see the curve of her thighs. We can see the hints of her breasts. Her hair backlit like that. The flatness of this image. Everything behind her is out of focus. Even she is out of focus for a lot of it. This is somebody who's transfigured by light. And just for fun, look at this image of her. <laughs> is that sublime? You know, the lighting's completely different. Cold, harsh, hard. No softness here. Uh, this was originally a black and white image and it's been colorized. But you know, her tiny face amongst all these textures and fabrics and colors. And um, it's it's um, it's like the most complicated Renaissance painting. It's a bit like the uh, Bologna painting that we saw earlier. And finally, in this section, we have this Furiosa in Mad Max Fury Road. I'm sure you've seen this film, a tyrannical man, and she is escaping and she's leading the resistance, a revolution against this man. I think the whole film is sublime. Look at her eyes at the top, peering out of the dark like Garbo's eyes. Look at her eyes in the middle, look at her eyes in the bottom. These are piercing things. These are the hope for the world, the, her, her energy, her athleticism, her drive, her fury, her name is Furiosa. These are elements of the sublime. Okay, after that, time for another day off. Welcome back. Um, my name is Mark Cousins. As you probably know, if you've listened so far, thanks for staying with me in this chat. I'm trying to think about um, how we look at films in new ways or bold ways or inventive ways or passionate ways. And of course, the context is that there's a lot going on in the world and borders are going up and people, oh, there's another one of those sirens you've heard. If you've listened so far, you've heard quite a few of those, a reminder of the outside world. So we're trying to think of ways of um, looking at cinema, which is really global and passionately believes in the idea of cinema as a universal language. So, particularly, I'm trying to imagine what if we had 40 days to learn about films or to love movies or to think about movies, what would we do? And we're on day 17, Rebellion. If you've seen lots of old movies, you'll recognize this one, Rebel Without a Cause. There's James Dean in the middle, sort of shoving his dad around. This is the classic sense that we have of what rebellion is in cinema, certainly in old movies. And James Dean was in some ways rebellious. But what else can we say about rebellion in cinema? What else does it look like? Maybe this. John Waters' film Pink Flamingos. This is Divine, uh, the actor Divine, who I'm sure you know what's happening here, but I'm going to describe it. That dog has just done a poo and Divine is eating it. Now, this is uh, a sort of horrible to see in the cinema and fascinating and funny and repulsive as well. And But what John Waters was doing naturally just because of who he is, there's another ambulance to hear that, uh, just, what, just of who he was, he was trying to challenge what good taste is. What you know? What are the refinements? What the what are the lineaments of gratified desire in cinema? And so he has divine this inventive drag queen actually eating dog dirt. What how challenging is that? But in a completely different way. How about this for a challenge? Who is she? This woman. She's from Senegal. She's in a film called Hyenas by Jibril Jop Mombeti, a great director, a sort of punkiest director in African cinema. This is a story. It's from a play, but he totally reinvented it. This is a woman who 
was having a relationship with a guy and he jilted her. He basically dumped her. And so the woman went away. And when she was away, she became rich and famous. And she was, as I, as I recall, you know, she um, got so much money. And when she, then she decided to go back to visit the place where she had such hurt and visit the man who hurted her, hurt her so much. And she comes back half gold. It was remarkable. She's got, like, she's not fully human. She's half gold. It's almost bionic. And everybody wants her now because she's rich and she comes from a poor town. And everybody wants a bit of her. People in her town want a new fridge. They want the latest consumer goods. This film's a satire on consumerism, etc., in West Africa. And she says, shockingly, astonishingly, she says, OK, you can have all you want as long as you kill him. And she points to the man who jilted her. Wow. Look at her face. Can you see it in her face? Her anger, her desire for retribution. The film's called Hyenas, and uh, please try to see it. It's um, If you haven't seen any African films made by indigenous African filmmakers, this is a good place to start. So rebellious. He was so daring. More conventional way about being daring, but nonetheless a good way, is the advice of the German uh, director Werner Herzog, whose work we've already seen. Uh, but here's another bit of advice from him: <laughs> When you're when you're a filmmaker, have a fake I ID. He says, um, try to you know don't ask permission. Ask permission afterwards, and I think that. You can see in so many filmmakers that kind of edge, that kind of daring, that kind of determination not to be polite and go through the authorities. And this is an example of that. Have a fake ID. And what's his second piece of advice? Just as important. Wire cutters. He says that, <laughs> he says that you know, if you want to film somewhere, just cut the wire and go in. And I think that, you know, there are downsides to that, but it's certainly very useful advice not to be too polite. And some of the best filmmakers are not too polite. So day 18 on our journey, what do we do then? Why don't we look at tension in films? There are loads of ways of looking at this. One of the most famously tense films that... You, you might have seen that I've seen is this one, Alfred Hitchcock's film Psycho. This is a detective. He's in a house. There's been a murder, we think, in the house. We probably we know it's in a house. He thinks it's been a murder. And so he's climbing a staircase. Look where the camera is above his head, looking down on him, out of focus behind him, etc. And he climbs slowly. We're more tense than he is. He's probably nervous. But we know that there's a killer in the house of some sort. We don't know who the killer is, but we know she or he is probably lurking. And Alfred Hitchcock was great at this. And he famously said, you know, a shock is one thing. If, people, if someone is happy and unaware that something terrible is going to happen, that's one thing. But if you know it's going to happen then your heart is beating faster. If you know something terrible is going to happen, every second is a second of dread. And we, the audience, know something terrible is going to happen to this man. And what actually happens is that the camera goes high and then somebody runs out with a knife and stabs him. This next film is one of my favourites. It's made by Noriaka Shuchimoto, and it's a very serious film. It's another documentary. I've got lots of documentaries in here, and it's one of the great environmental documentaries. It's uh, The film explains itself, but I'll just say one thing, which is that it is 
about a company that polluted, massively polluted uh, the watercourse in a bit of Japan. And we're not going to see in this clip, but the tension comes from the fact that the parents and the victims, the people who were uh, underwent biological deformities as a result of this terrible pollution, confront the managers, the board of the organization. Here goes. These are the fisher people before the pollution happened. That tension, that tension in that short confrontation with the mother screaming at the boss of the organization. The, in Psycho, the tension is pure suspense. It's pleasurable. It's entertainment. This isn't entertainment. This is the world clashing up, crashing up against itself. And a remarkable film. And my favorite ever film about tension is this one. Muhammad Ali Talabi from Iran. We've heard lots of about Iranian filmmakers and famous filmmakers like Abbas Kiarostami, for example. This little boy, see, he's holding a pane of glass here. The backstory is that he was at school and he broke a glass in the school, a piece of glass in the school. And so um, his teacher said, you know, the window is now broken. You need to go and get some glass. So the boy has to go to the neighbouring village in the neighbouring valley and buy a piece of glass and carry it home. And this is him carrying it home. And a storm begins and it it gets wilder and wilder and as it does so as it blows harder and harder we can see the glass bending in the wind is it going to break is it going to break is it going to hurt the boy look he doesn't have anything even between his hands and the glass the sort of gentleness of the boy the danger of the glass remarkable film one of the best i've seen From tension to day 19, poetics. Sounds like the opposite. Tension is hard and exciting and adrenalized and poetics is gentle and etc. What do we mean by poetics? Here's Emily Dickinson, one of my favorite poets. Uh, she was living in the 1800s in Concord in Northeast America. And she wrote one of her most famous films is about one of her most famous poems is about hope. It's called Hope, I think. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest is the gale, and sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm. It's interesting, sore must be the storm. Storm will never be easy. And sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land, 
and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. What does hope look like? What does poetics look like in cinema? And still on poetics, here's a, a great film from the 1920s, from 1926, called Rien que les heures, Nothing But the Hours, literally. Uh, it's made by a guy called Alberto Cavalcanti. You might have seen his work. He was 29 when he made this film. I think this was his first film. He's a Brazilian. He was really into sound design. He had a fantastic career. He traveled the world. He was gay. He was inventive. He was radical. And this was a sort of portrait film of Paris. And at the time, it was cool and fashionable to make films about cities. They called them city symphonies. But this was probably the best. And even in this image here, this kind of splintered image, you can see something inventive. What about this image? I think you've seen this film. Joker. Joachim Phoenix dancing down a set of steps up in the Bronx in, in New York State. What a troubling and brilliant scene this was you know, in terms of poetics. Why is this poetic? I think it's poetic because whatever you think of the film, the grey and brown steps imagery and his bright pink and yellow and green outfit, he stands out. He's a cartoon character. And in the story, if you've seen it, you know there's this is a moment where he has been told he can go on TV. This is a man who needs his ego exposed. He needs to be seen. He's an sort of exhibitionist. He feels as if he's been overlooked by the world and society. And so he's doing a, a triumphal dance, uh, a, a sort of mythic dance almost, in the moments before he goes on TV. And the music uh, is, the choice of music is remarkable here as well. What else about the poetics of cinema? What about this? David Lynch, his film Inland Empire, yeah, I, which, I, which is his most complex film, I think, and I'm sure you've seen some of his other films, one of his most labyrinthine films. Before I saw it, people said, you know, you'll never understand it. And about a third of the way through, I thought, they're wrong, they're wrong, I'm understanding it. And then it started to happen in all sorts of new ways and it seemed to burrow into different realms and past and present and real different realities and I became utterly clueless. I was lost in the labyrinth and I liked it even more for that. Here in particular this is... <laughs> what is this? It's a soap opera with rabbits and, and Lynch made this into a story with rabbits but that sense of rabbits the fact that they burrow down under the earth uh, into the inland empire was um, frankly brilliant that was day 19 what about day 20 I've called it the mirth of nations what about comedy people say that comedy is very culturally specific what Germans laugh at Scots don't laugh at, what Scots laugh at, Japanese don't laugh at. Is that true? I don't know. I suspect not. Tom and Jerry. <laughs> the little mouse and the big cat. The cat who's constantly trying to eat the mouse or kill the mouse or frustrated by the mouse. And yet, so many times, the valiant little mouse gets one over the cat. Here's an example of it. 1967. Another comedy. French comedy. Jacques Tati's film Playtime. Tati is, if you move your eye up into the centre of the screen and then slightly left, you'll see him hunched, looking forward. Uh, he's playing a character called Monsieur Hulot, and Monsieur Hulot basically is clueless about the world. The world's moving too fast for him. There's all this new technology. He feels left out. He's bumbling. He just 
doesn't have a clue about what's going on. And this is a brilliant example of, of how to show that and with an image. So everybody's in a box, everybody's got telephones, and they're wearing smart office gear, etc., and he's walking around excluded. The boxes are higher than him, so he can't even see what's happening inside. The world has moved on. And that sense of, of Monsieur Hulot not really having a clue is where the comedy comes from. And a more recent comedy? I don't know if you saw the Deadpool films, but uh, I did, and I loved them. And I loved the fact that it married superhero ideas, superhero storylines, superhero CGI effects was something that was a bit transgressive. It was, you know, a bit queer. And look at even that. Great ass. Are we allowed to admire his ass? Especially when he puts his finger in his lips like that, like a girl. Day 20 was about comedy. Day 21, commentary, we're jumping again. You know, if you make a film and you have a commentary in it, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It used to be said in Hollywood, you only use a commentary, commentary in your film when it's absolutely necessary. What if you use it when it's absolutely unnecessary turn it on its head flip it over here's an example of of a brilliant use of commentary in a film soy cuba i am cuba it was made by a guy called kalatazov you've probably seen the film the very first words as i recall in this film are i am cuba it's not this is cuba or here is cuba or i live in cuba it is i am cuba and what's so daring about that for me is that a nation is speaking. A nation can't literally have a voice, obviously, but this filmmaker decided to give it a voice. And what I loved is that that means that immediately, as soon as the nation says, soy Cuba, I am Cuba, we know this is not a piece of journalism. It's not a reportage. We're in a different realm, an imaginative realm, a poetic realm. And talking of which, here's this film, Chris Marker's Sans Soleil. Oh, I've called, I've spelt it Sand Soleil, which means sand, sun, it should say without sun. Um, but <laughs> anyway, Chris Marker, a great French director, essayist. And what's great about this film is that he, f he this is a, a shot on Super 8 millimeter, as you can see, like amateur footage, for example, and he traveled the world and he filmed a lot in very, very many countries in Japan and different countries. And then he made a film about those travels. But instead of saying, I went here, I did this, which would be too obvious, uh, he, uh, nor did he ask a famous actor to say he did this or he did that. He imagined writing letters to a woman and then he imagined her reading the letters and then he imagined what she would say after reading them. So that's like a triply distanced thing. So in this film again and again we hear a woman's voice saying he wrote me, he wrote me. So what is great about that is um, he's asking a question of who speaks from where and when. So the person telling the story of this film is imaginative. She doesn't exist. She's from the future and she's got an oversight about the film really daring. It really takes the film out of any documentary realm or journalistic realm into something really quite different. That was day 21. Day 22. Movement and blocking. What does that mean? That means like, what do you do in a frame? If you look through your camera and you see a frame, how do you get people to move within the frame? Where do you put them? Are close to the camera or far away? One of the greatest blockers in cinema was this man. There he is in the left, Orson Welles. Made Citizen Kane, of course. 
one of the most famous films in movie history, one of the most claim, acclaimed films in movie history. And this is his film, Chimes at Midnight. On, he's playing full staff. And if you remember back when we were talking about the Z-axis and depth, look at the way those bits of wood in the ceiling are plunging into the distance towards that white, white light in the center. So already we've got something interesting here, a deep, deep space. And his big belly sticking out as, as if it's into the space as well. But look where the camera is, so low, so very low. And there's Jean Moreau, center right, looking into the camera. It's like the camera is almost at the bed where she is with the other guy. And that kind of, the way that Orson Welles would create this space, because he directed this picture as well, and put the camera so low and give us this massive foreground, that bit of wood, and that beautiful plunging background. Where did his visual ideas come from? Could it be from this? This is the painter, the Italian painter, Tintoretto. And look at her on the bottom right. Look at the way her bum is sticking out. Look at the camera is at her feet. And then look above and there's the sky and the trees and all that other stuff. Tintoretto, if he had a camera, and of course he didn't because he was painting way back hundreds of years ago, he would have plonked it at the feet at the bed, at the people lying on the bed, the way Orson Welles does, back to that image. So that's what staging is in a way. Where do you put people in relation to the camera? How do you film the, the scene? How do you dynamize the scene? How do you f come, fill it with fury? One of the best people at doing this is this guy. Choi Hak, that's how you pronounce his name. It looks like Su Hark, but it's Choi Hak great great Hong Kong director and one of his heroes made this film King Hu directed the film it's called The Touch of Zen and if Orson Welles and if the painter Tintoretto were locking the camera down close to the ground this is something like the opposite this is assuming that there's no gravity look at her upside down Defying gravity. Remarkable image. Remarkable filmmaker. And after staging, what might we jump to next unexpectedly? What about sound poetics? <laughs> you didn't know that was coming, did you? Have a look at this boy. Look at the startled look in his face. What's the story behind this image? The story is that this boy has been deaf all his life. And then, if you look at there's a wire going up to his ear, this is a photograph of the first moment when he hears. The first time that sound enters his brain, enters his emotions. What a beautiful image. The shock of sound. Who's been best at sound in cinema? I would argue Kira Muratova. We've seen her work before. You remember the big focus pool? Here she is again, Ukrainian, Russian. She was obsessed by sound and brilliant at it. And also talking about sound, look at this. There's a film called Come and See. This boy in the foreground with that tragic face and the grey hair. He's a boy and yet his hair is already grey. This is a film set in Belarus during the terrible period when the Nazis killed uh, many people and burnt loads of villages. And there's an incredible scene in this film where the boy has experienced in close-up a bomb. And the bomb, the sound waves of the bomb have messed with his ears and he undergoes tinnitus and he can't hear and not only in that moment can he not hear but in the whole film it's like his ears are blocked it's a bold and daring film you might have seen it if you haven't please do So uh, we're imagining 40 days to learn film 
40 ways to learn film, or I would say 40 ways to love film. So let's go to the next day, day 24, music taught in the dark. So we can't talk about film without talking about music. Even in silent film, there was music. At the beginning of this, I asked you to have a scarf at the ready. Here's the reason. I'd like you to tie that scarf around your eyes or close your eyes really tight and just be in the dark and listen to the following. It's Bernard Herrmann's Scene d'Amour for Alfred Hitchcock's film Vertigo. It's five minutes long and see what you feel. Did you feel your heart beat faster there? Did you feel as if you were kind of riding the thermals almost, that rise and rise? And when my eyes are closed, I sort of feel as if I'm looking out into the night sky. And I'm sure I can see things, almost planets or something, or that kind of misty thing, that sort of vague, out of focus, blurry world, infinite world that you can see when your eyes are closed. Day 25. Try to show that which without you might never have been seen. That's a quote from the great uh, French filmmaker Robert Bresson, and I think that's a pretty much the best advice I've ever heard as a filmmaker. Try to put something on screen that you've never seen before. An emotion, a shape, a story, a character, a joke, a street, something that's never been seen before. So what would be some examples of that? What if we spent a day looking at films like that? One that was key for me was this one, Divorce Iranian style. Uh, I'd never been to Iran when I saw this film. It's a documentary, and it's about women and men in a divorce court discussing in really quite a lot of detail how they, as Iranians within their law, will break up amicably if possible. You know, our media portrays Iran in a certain way, it portrays Islam in a certain way. And this changed my sense of what Islam is. <clears throat> Another filmmaker who changed my view of the world is this guy, Anand Patwardhan. I think he's the greatest living documentary filmmaker. He's from India. He's daring and bold and challenging and risks his safety to tell people the truth of what's happening in India. India at the moment has a right-wing government, but for the longest time, long before this government, Anand Patwardhan has been pointing his finger and at the problems, the inequalities, the injustices, the ideologies in India. This is his most recent film. It's called Reason. And this is a sort of uh, a very religious person who tries to convince the population that he has stuck that thing through his tongue to try and convince them to be religious, not to be rational, not to be reasonable, to be superstitious. But Pat Bardan shows in the film that there's a kind of hook around the edge of that spike and therefore it's not going through his tongue, it's going around the side of his tongue. A simple thing but a very important message for India. And Anpat Bardhan is a hero for me. Day 26, distinctive voice. What's a distinctive voice in cinema? Well, I would say, for example, this is this is a scene from Orson Welles' film, The Trial. Look at the size of tiny little Anthony Perkins. Look at the size of that vast door. This is from uh, a fiction by Franz Kafka, but... Orson Welles, when you see an image from his films, you can usually tell it's a good guess that it's Orson Welles. It's extravagant. It's visually striking. It's, to use a sort of art history word, baroque. Uh, it's anti-realist often. And that is one of the most striking images in his work. Also in distinctive voices, I think the most distinctive voice of a filmmaker working today is the person who made this film, Uncle Bunui. His name, you can see there is Apichatpong Verisathakul, a beautiful name. And he, you know, so many filmmakers are making films where people are only real people living in the material current world in the present time or in a specific moment. But in his films, past lives haunt people. This one, for example, is about 
an old gentleman who's dying and he remembers his previous lives. I haven't seen it in a while, but you see that figure there that looks like a sort of gorilla in the jungle with red dots for eyes. I think that's his son, as I recall, his dead son, perhaps. But anyway, it's a figure not from the real world, um, not even from the imaginative world, but from the kind of mystical world, it's a mythic world. Uh, who's come back to chat to Uncle Bunmi. What's so moving about the film is Uncle Bunmi's dying, and he takes great comfort in these people who come from other realms or from the past, because the film seems to say that his life will go on in some way after he dies. Day 27, Endings. Good ending out of of a film. What if we spent a day just looking at endings like this one? Shirley MacLaine, this is a Billy Wilder film, The Apartment. She has sort of been in love with this guy, but didn't really know it. And he's been in love with her and didn't really say it. At the ending of the film, she's at a party and suddenly she hears something that tells her that he loved her. So she runs down the street And then she runs into his apartment block and up the stairs. And at this moment, she hears a bang and she thinks, oh, no, he's killed himself. But he hasn't. He's opened a bottle of champagne and it was the champagne cork we hear. Joyous, joyous, uh, unsentimental, bitter, beautiful film. Another ending. You know, sometimes in cinema we think of an ending as that big crescendo, that those famous endings in Hollywood where the music soars and the camera rises and maybe we see a landscape or a kiss or something. Those are very satisfying endings, you know, the sort of climax of the emotional climax. But this film, Late Spring, is about a father and his daughter and the sort of tenderness between them and she has to move on in life. She has to get married. She has to have her own life. And instead of a big fancy ending, Yasujira Ozu ends with the father peeling an apple. Solitary, a little sad, but, you know, beautiful, a haiku, and just the tenderness of that. And there are pleasures in the simple things, obviously, like peeling an apple. And Ozu discovers that pleasure. Now, how about this for an ending slightly resonant of what we're going through at the moment? This is Antonioni's film Le Clisa, uh, and it's been about a couple and people, and we've seen the woman in particular, Monica Vitti. But then the film that has been about them seems to abandon them. They seem to disappear. The world seems to empty. And so at the end of the film, we see an empty sidewalk, we see empty streets, etc. And it's like they disappear into the city, like they dissolve. Day 28, interviewing. There's another one of those ambulances. I think this is the third or even the fourth we've heard as we've been talking. Interviewing. Now, that's something that documentary filmmakers do more than fiction filmmakers, but... Interviewing, you know, isn't only journalistic. When we think of an interview in a film, we think of what we call a talking head, a single person giving their opinions, talking to the camera, etc. But there are inventive ways of doing it, like this, for example. This is a film called Portrait of Jason. This is Jason, an extravagant man, African-American. He's drinking a lot. He's gay. And what's great about the film is that the filmmaker, Shirley Clark, interrogated him in an intense, long-form way. We see, see bottom left there. You can see he's giggling. He's got drunk at this point. And I think that she interviewed him all day and all night, 24 hours or more, I can't remember exactly, but we can see him slowly unravel or unfurl or open up or expose things about himself that perhaps he wouldn't have done so. It's almost like the exhaustion of talking so long about yourself and your world and Shirley Clark captures that brilliantly. You know, it's ethically maybe maybe unclear if she did the right thing to use the camera to expose him so much but the result is riveting 
another great interview film, this one. This woman looking at a screen. Uh, the film is directed by Imamura Shohei, one of my favorite filmmakers. And it's called, it's got a long title, it's called The History of Post-War Japan as Told by a Bar Hostess. On the right is the bar hostess. But what's lovely is that it's not an official history. She's not a historian. She's not an elite person. She's a regular woman, uh, working class, has a job to do, runs a bar. And so her view of Japan, its history, is not the official history. It's not an academic history. It's a very gutsy history. Imamura doesn't ask her many questions. He just shows her images and then she responds. So it's a visual response, it's a raw response, it's an untutored response, and it's fantastic. Another type of interviewing is this one. I don't know what film this is, but what I love about this is that often we talk about the talking head when we interview one person talking to another person. This is the talking group. In India, of course, the population's so big, there are seldom times when you're on your own with somebody. But boy, do you get groups of people. So the woman on the right is saying something, and all those women in front of her will talk to the woman on the right, but they'll also talk amongst themselves and dispute and argue and agree and disagree with themselves. And so you get this kind of interaction between a group of people, the talking group. And now, what about this film? An empty apartment in Paris. Is there anything unusual about it? Indeed, yes. The film's called Marlena. Uh, it's directed by Maximilian Schell. It's supposed to be about one of the great movie stars, Marlena Dietrich, who was famous in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, etc. She agreed to do an interview with her friend, Maximilian Schell. She was old at this time, probably in her 80s, and she cared about how she looked. She was famous for her beauty, and she hadn't been photographed for many years. He showed up with his camera, and she said, what's that for? And he said, to do the interview, and she said, no sound only. And he was devastated. A film in which there's sound only? How could that work? That's disastrous. We're not going to get the money shot. We're not going to see Dietrich, the famous movie star. And yet, this terrible negative turned into a positive because he did do an interview with her in sound only, in audio only. But then he took photographs of the apartment like this one in which she was living and he recreated her apartment in a studio and then had his camera drift through the studio. And guess what? It was so evocative. It was haunting it was like a phantom ride. It was like the spirit of Dietrich was drifting through her own apartment. Magnificent. Better than if she'd just been on camera. Final day in this chunk, day 29. This is just a small thing, but I think I feel it's quite a political thing to say that so often when we see films or TV, they give a certain sense of a place. For example, this place. This is Tehran, a very busy city, the capital of Iran, of course, the hills in the distance. And for years I'd seen films about Iran and our Western media had told me stuff about Iran and Tehran. And then I went there. I actually drove there from here in Scotland. And guess what? It was nothing like I'd been told. Okay, so our last chunk of days in this little exercise, we're imagining 40 days to learn film, 40 ways to learn film, 40 ways to love film. Day 31, I thought we could do something very serious, spend a whole day trying to learn about somewhere in the world uh, where something compelling is happening. Why not choose the Lesbos refugee camp? 20,000 people living in temporary accommodation, temporary shelter, in circumstances that are virtually unimaginable. People from Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Somalia, etc., Palestine. We obviously are facing challenges now, but hard to imagine what they're going through. I once went briefly to the Calais 
camp uh, for refugees and um, I thought I'd seen the worst of life. I've been in wars. I was in the war in Sarajevo, but I felt as if like I'd opened a trap door and gone down into a cellar of a more profoundly tragic way of living than I had ever seen. be hard to recover from a day studying that but day 32 I thought we could look at something like long form the idea of a long film or a long story or that kind of big epic mode of storytelling so often we're told that young people in particular have short attention spans that everybody just wants a TikTok or a YouTube clip but big long form things the box set are also compelling. We love to get lost in them. We love to feel the unraveling story, the slow, epic way of getting lost in the labyrinth. Thought I'd mention this man, Shin Shinsuka Ogawa. <clears throat> he set up a production company called Ogawa Pro, Ogawa Productions, Japanese, another documentary filmmaker. And he became dissatisfied with the way films were made. So he wanted to make films about the farmers in Japan who were protesting against the massive Narita airport construction and so he spent years filming with them but he wanted to even get further and deeper into the lives of his people so then he took on a project another rural project about uh, called Magino and he lived there and worked with the community for decades extraordinary immersion in the world of his subject this is a scene from one of his films this woman's talking about him having been there for 10 years. This remarkable film is also long form. You've probably seen it, Boyhood. Uh, it's a, a rather splendid film uh, that, which stars the same actor, that's him, the whole way through, L.R. Coltrane, I think he's called. And on the left there, he's six years old. And on the right, he's 18 years old. The director, Richard Linklater, filmed for approximately 12 years it's a fiction film. They improvise the story somewhat. And we see the boy grow up. We see cinema grow up in a way. Remarkable to see that kid turn into the bearded young man on the right. And one of my favourite long films, This there's a five-hour version of this. It's Fanny och Alexander, Fanny and Alexander, directed by Ingmar Bergman. And Fanny is in the foreground there, Alexander's in the middle. And we see their lives, again, their epic lives. Lots of family trauma, but celebratory Christmas uh, magical scenes. If you want to watch a great Christmas film, watch Alex, Fanny and Alexander. It's almost like a Christmas card that's gradually unfurls. Day 33, memory. Great subject for cinema, isn't it? And this film, hopefully you've seen this film. This is, <clears throat> this is Memento, uh, directed by Christopher Nolan, and that's Guy Pearce, and you can see he's got tattoos on his body. It's a remarkable story. He plays a character who can form no new memories and... Uh, loses his memory every 15 minutes or so. And so he has to devise ways of knowing where he's going in life, what he's doing in life. He's on a particular quest. You can see on his chest there it says, find him and kill him. That's his quest. The film has got two modes, the black and white one, and this is an image from the black and white bit, which moves forward in time, but the color sequences move backward in time. So it's a playing with loss of memory and the idea that the film, the, the, the trauma, the sadness, the grief of loss of memory. And now one of the classic films about memory. Look at that. Ingrid Bergman in the 1942 Hollywood classic, Casablanca. Look at the sadness on her face. Look at the beauty on her face. Look at that lighting. It, if you've seen the film, you'll know it's about two people who had a love affair in Paris and they meet years later during the war and they remember back to a time of happiness and innocence. Gorgeous in itself, but then add this image to it on the right Ingrid Bergman again, older now. If the first film was 1942, this is 36 years later. The film's called Autumn Sonata. The composition is exactly the same. The head is in the same position. 
even the lighting is a little similar, although a lot harsher. But look at the red now, the red of her lips, the red of her eyes, the sadness. The woman on the left that we, they filmed before the war was over, before the trauma of the gas chambers, for example, were exposed. And almost you can see in the face of the woman on the right some of the horrors of the decade of the 20th century. Fantastic films both, but the combination, you can see a kind of world in the combination of those two faces. And then this, also talking of World War II, The Sorrow and the Pity. Directed by Marcel Offuls, you can just see there at the bottom. This is one of the best documentaries that there's ever been made. Uh, the sort of after World War II, as you know, France had this story of the resistance, the resistance to valiant local people who fought the Nazis, who stood up for the French and for the République, etc. But this film shows that the truth was rather less glorious. It exposes widespread collaboration between the French and the Nazis and the Vichy government. A remarkable, sobering film had a big impact on French life. Day 34, Self. How do you put yourself in a film if you're making a film? How do you put yourself in an image if you're making an image? Here's one of my favourite examples, Frida Kahlo. There she is, standing in the middle, standing on a plinth. To the left of her there, we see her native Mexico. We see the sun on the top left with a fork coming out of it. And we see lightning and we see flowers on the bottom left. And we see images of ancient Mexican culture. Look on the right of her, and there's America, the American flag, and skyscrapers like New York, and smoke. And you could say that this is painting of hers that's saying, look how brilliant the left is, and look how terrible the right is. But not necessarily so, because she loved aspects of modernism. Uh, on those, you can just about see on those smokestacks on the right, it says F-O-R-D, Ford. And she'd just been in a clinic called Ford where she, I think, had had a miscarriage. And so there's a complexity in this image. And even visually, top left, the sun, and then move your eye to bottom right. And that kind of goldy coloured radiator, what a visual echo that is. She's plonked herself on the border between Mexico and America. A border which, of course, is newly politicised now in the era of Trump. And another great film, Stories We Tell, Sarah Poli, a Canadian filmmaker. This is another documentary, actually. And in it, she tells the story of her family and explores a secret, I won't give too much away, but an secret aspect of her family. She asks her father to narrate the story, and yet her father is part of the secret uh, an award-winning film, and rightly so. So that was her way of putting herself into her film. And the final example of putting yourself into the imagery is this one. The Bill Douglas trilogy shot a few miles away from where I'm sitting here. Bill Douglas was a great filmmaker from Scotland. He came from a very working-class background. Uh, those houses behind, them, behind him there are exactly the sort of houses in which he grew up. That's not him uh, in the foreground. That's an actor, Wee Jamie, playing him um, and playing a sort of version of him. And this is a sad little boy who's got a difficult life and he's sequestered and treated badly. And he's very inside himself. But slowly, slowly, you realise that he's becoming a creative figure. He's starting, starting to turn his... Uh, adverse conditions into something tentatively beautiful and inventive. Uh, the film is just glorious and it reminds me of the, of the films of Sergei Eisenstein. Where are we going next? How about day 35? Avoiding banalities. This is a sort of practical thing, I think. Every time somebody asks me what was the most difficult thing about making your film, I always say avoiding banalities. It's so, so easy to do the obvious thing, the conventional thing, the formulaic thing, the banal thing. 
but if you try always, I think, to do something that isn't banal, you get somewhere much richer, obviously. So what do we mean by that? Well, gong writing is one banality. If you read a script or you watch a film and you hear something that's really obvious, it feels as if they're banging a gong. So it's called in the industry gong writing. Story signposting. We know what that is. When you're watching a film and suddenly you can feel the story saying, look out for her, she's going to die in the third act. Or look out for this guy, he's going to be significant later on. Or there's somebody with a cough. You know, when people cough in film, you know they're going to die later on. So you have to try and adv- uh, avoid such story signposting. And again, this is a question not only for filmmakers, it's a question for people who are writing about film or or who are just enjoying film. But what about avoiding visual banalities? Look at that image. This is from the Spider-Verse film from a few years ago, which I loved. There have been so many superhero movies, and a lot of them, we have to say, are quite similar, and we know what's going to happen, even though they're entertaining often. But the Spider-Verse film had its own strange colours. Look at this pink in the middle, and that sort of pale lime green on the right, and this yellow on the left. And But also look at the way this painting is done. It looks like it's sort of a digital collapse almost. The film was wildly inventive. At times it looked as if it had been printed on paper. And it was dazzling. And a recent film was The Lighthouse, a film with a square black and white frame, starred Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe. Uh, Robert Patterson comes to a sticky end. I'm going to give away the ending here, I'm afraid. But what I love is that the filmmaker who uh, used images of unusual intensity to influence the scenes in the film. So, for example, this is an etching on the left. You can see a guy there is lying, dying as he's eaten by birds, pecked by birds. And here is the scene in the film where Robert Pattinson expires. Look. Very similar, very similar composition. Overall, we can see the strong influence of the image on the left on the image of the, on the right. The image on the left isn't even from cinema, of course, but look at how powerful a scene it created. Next day, day 36, uh, we're getting towards the end of our epic voyage here. I thought we could consider beginnings. How do you begin a great film? Here's how David Lynch begins a great film. This is his great film, Blue Velvet. And he starts on the sky and the camera slowly drifts down to a white picket fence, as you can see, and red roses. And what he says brilliantly, I'm lucky enough to have spent a bit of time with him, and what he says brilliantly is that you should float into a story. And again and again in his films, particularly this one, it feels as if the opening shot, the camera is on a kind of balloon and it's slowly, slowly descending into the world of the story. But if you don't float, you plunge. This is Steven Spielberg's film, Saving Private Ryan, World War II. Uh, gutsy, intense film. But what Spielberg does so well is he plunges us in near the beginning of the film. Uh, The camera literally feels as if it's chucked underwater. And if you see there a light stripe, a diagonal stripe in the bottom right uh, part of the film, that is the trace of a bullet. And there's another one on the top left of the film and also those red bits of the bl- blood coming out of the bodies of the soldiers uh, remarkably intense and it's so it's sound and vision and action everything working together to give you a sense of being underwater of being immersed being immersed in the world and immersed in the fear of this moment and then <laughs> I like this one. Day 37, recut. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that there are great films that are too long and they need a recut, I think. And here are some examples of them. And I think it seems sacrilege to recut a film. But I just think we shouldn't be afraid of that idea. And I think creatively, as filmmakers, we ca- we could take a classic film and recut it. And as film lovers, we can think of great films and imagine how we would recut them. 
So, for example, this one, Kwaidan Kobayashi's film, it's a compilation, a brilliant series of horror f- short films combined into one long film. But the one long film is over three hours and at least one of the stories isn't very good so what would I do? I would cut out the rubbish story (laughs) another example Limite by Mario Peixoto this is um, a Brazilian film a silent film as I recall um, really early I think 1932 or something or 1930 I can't remember exactly but it's magnificent but it's far too slow The imagery, as you can see, for example, this image of this woman's face, is beautiful, but it goes on way too long, I think. So it's a terrible thing to say. The archivists would hate me, but I would cut half an hour out of it. (laughs) I'm enjoying this bit. Steven Spielberg again, War of the Worlds. I loved Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, but I thought it had about three or four endings, and I would cut out two of them, I think, the last two probably. I sort of wished that I'd left the film about five minutes before the end, maybe a bit more. And if we love cinema, uh, we can talk in this way, you know, we can be bold and say that things could be improved. And we, it's, it's also good for our imaginations to ask how we might improve a flawed but otherwise very good film. Getting near the end, day 38. What should we do in day 38? How about think of life itself, what it is, and how filmmakers have taught us about it. I've got no images here, but I thought we could spend a day on YouTube or uh, reading books, learning more about the lives of the following people. I'm just going to mention their names and you can research them if you want. Kinyo Tanaka, Bill Douglas, who we saw a few minutes ago, Moritz Stiller, a great Swedish director who went to America. Mai Zetterling, a great Swedish director. Marta Mezaros and Guru Dutt, who I often call the Orson Welles of India. If you've got time, look up these people. Each of them had fascinating life stories and each of them made magnificent films. Day 39, love. We have to talk about love, don't we? Love at a time of crisis or love in good times, love in bad times. So what films could we talk about that are good at love? Let's start with this one, Etre et Voir, directed by Nicolas Philibert. On the left is a teacher, Mr. Lopez, and on the right is one of his students. And we just watch him teach a simple thing, uh, but he does it beautifully. You can see that he loves his pupils and they love him. And it's just a beautiful film about that kind of emotion, that attachment, especially that kids have to adults that have kept them safe. We can see here his schoolroom, which is covered in images and all sorts of things to play with and learn from. And it's like a harbour, a safe place before they go out into the world. Great film about love. Fassbinder's Fear Eats the Soul. It's also called Ali. And so the relationship between these two people. She's an older German woman and he's a younger guest worker. I think he's Turkish or Moroccan, I can't remember. And it's a genuine, beautiful love story. But because of the times, it they are mis- they are badly treated by their neighbours and by society. People think the age difference is too much. People are racist because he's not a white German, etc. And often in a love story, the key question is what's stopping them? What's stopping them? And here it's society that's trying to stop them. And one of the most perverse love stories now, I think, ever filmed it's called The Apple directed by Samira Makmalbaf an an Iranian great Iranian filmmaker and she was 18 when she made this film and it's about these two girls who are locked up as you can see they're locked up by their father their father's a very traditional man he's not a nasty man but he believes the outside world is scary and they won't be safe out there and so his love makes him an imprisoner of them. You can see they're smiling here, but they are really, really ill-equipped 
for the outside world, when we fin- when I eventually I see them going out, they they walk gingerly. They almost sort of touch the world with the lightest touch. Like, what is this place that I'm experiencing? What's extra imaginative about the film is that this thing really happened to these girls in real life, but Samira Makmalbaf didn't film it as it was happening. She recreated it with them, so they're playing themselves. You could call it a sort of metafiction almost. And finally, I just wanted to mention her in this section. She's called Safi Fay. Uh, she made a film called Letter to My Village, and it was a love letter to her village in Senegal. And, you know, film as a love letter, one of the best. So, day 40, freedom. Maybe the virus is over, maybe we can get out. We can certainly get out in our head, but what does freedom look like? Like this person, when I see this split face, I think of freedom. Or is it this person, Beyonce, singing in the rain? Or does freedom to you feel like this guy, dancing? There's no place like here. There's a little place like now. As it says in a famous film, you just have to click your heels together. Thanks for listening and looking. I fancy a walk in the countryside, somewhere like this, even if it snows. Bye.